Now, as I mentioned already in the announcements, we are coming up on the start of February and we're going to be starting a brand new challenge for the month of February. And that challenge is going to be a challenge where we are going to be in prayer for a certain amount of time every day. And the, uh, the details of that, I'll go over them again because I missed anything. So the, the challenge, the prayer challenge is to pray for a minimum of 20 minutes per day. Minimum. You also need to pray for everybody on our prayer request list. Every prayer that's listed there every single day needs to be part of your prayers. Now, if you're praying for 20 minutes, that's not going to necessarily take up very much of your time. You know, oftentimes we don't have very many requests, but we want to make sure that you are praying for everyone on that list to meet the requirements. There's also a few other things that I want you to do for this challenge that it don't have a, a number specified with them or anything. But um, what we're going to get into a lot of the, the biblical reasons for these different things. But one of them is going to be spending some time in prayer on your knees. If you can, if you're able to physically uh, do so, I believe that is an important aspect of prayer that I think that many people don't do. And, and that helps with your humility going before God. And, and getting on your face before God when you ask Him for things and when you approach God, uh, that is something that I would I expect to be done. It doesn't have to be every single time that you pray. There's many different times during the day you could pray, but I want you to, to be considering that and taking time out at least during the month of February for this challenge to get on your knees and pray. Um, praying out loud. Also, if you, if you have a family, or a spouse or anything like that, if you have uh, you know, someone else that you live with, I'm going to encourage you to spend some time, it doesn't have to be there the whole time, but some time together praying out loud together. It's going to be, it's a great way to bond as a family. It's a great way. One of the things that we've done is, um, especially during these challenges, we'll pray for each other. You want to have a strong family. Well, it's a family that prays for each other and you're thinking about each other continually. You love it. I mean, when, when you're praying for other people, you're doing so because you care about those people, right? I mean, think about it. If you're, you're, if you're spending time to consider someone else and go to God and, and have a petition to God and, and a supplication for God to help out someone else, that is going to help your love for other people. I mean, that is loving just to be praying for other people. And especially within your family, you, you ought to have a bond of love within your family that everyone cares about one another. And when you hear out loud people praying for each other, that's also going to help you just, just understand and know, hey, my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, my, you know, they care about me. They love me. They're praying for me. And these are all things that should be coming from the heart. So I'm going to encourage people to do that as well. Pray as a family. Pray out loud. Um, obviously, you don't have to pray out loud in general in order to pray to God. There's lots of, of flexibility in the way that you can communicate with our Lord of, of when, you know, I pray oftentimes just silently in my mind. God knows the thoughts and, you know, of our hearts. God knows uh, what we have need of before we even open our mouths. He knows us, but there's still something to be said for praying out loud, for opening up your mouth. And we see many examples in Scripture that. Now, there's so many things I could preach on in Scripture on prayer. Prayer ought to be a really huge aspect of our life. It really ought to be. We think, given how many times we see examples and stories of people praying and just admonition and that it's just assumed to be part of your life. It ought to be a, a large portion. But what we don't have as with many other things in Scripture, we don't have a set number. You need to pray this much in order to be right with God. God doesn't say that. Just like in many, you know, it doesn't say how many times you have to attend church in order to be right with God. It doesn't say, you know, a lot of other real specific granule details because it's not about just checking off that checklist. And that's not what this, this challenge is about either. This challenge isn't about just checking off this checklist to make sure you're spiritual. The whole point of even putting a time limit on it is just, to, is just for you to, sit, to take a step back and say, am I really even spending time? You know, many people might say, oh yeah, I pray. I spend a lot of time in prayer. 
in what may seem like a lot of time in prayer for you, when you actually are kind of looking at a clock and saying, well, how much have I prayed today? You might realize you're not really spending as much time as you might think you're spending in prayer. And the whole point of this is to take the time and set it aside and say, I am going to make sure that I pray. Now, for the challenge, you, it doesn't have to be a 20-minute chunk all at once. Again, this isn't something that has to be done that just like the Bible reading is that you don't have to get your Bible reading all done at once. It ought to be spread out throughout the day because we ought to be getting in a habit of praying regularly. But if, if you do do it in a chunk, then it's still, I mean, it's 20 minutes either way, whether it's, you know, eight minutes in the morning and seven minutes in the afternoon and five minutes at night or whatever, you know, however you want to break it up, great. Or you could do 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, whatever you want to do, it's fine. Just, I just want you to be conscious of how much time am I really spending? Because I think one of the things, too, we get in a tendency or a habit of praying really quickly just to kind of get it out of the way and get it done. But praying quickly isn't always the most effective way to pray because we want to make sure we're praying to God. And, and think about this. Now, we started off in Acts chapter 3. And I'm going to spend a lot of time just, just looking at the time spent with examples from Scripture. In Acts chapter 3, verse number 1, the Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. Now I know that that's the time that the prayer time start, but you know what they had in the temple? They had an hour of prayer. They had a time where it was set aside, hey, this is the time where we come together and we pray. And it was established as a prayer time. Now I don't think that the verbiage literally means that the, the time lasted for an hour. It was the hour that you go there to pray. However, we're going to see in Scripture that people setting time aside to pray is oftentimes way longer than an hour. Now, the title of my sermon is Sweet Hour of Prayer, and I think an hour of prayer daily is, is probably where we ought to be. The challenge I made a lot easier, and again, that's just based off of my, just what my experience is and what my intuition is just on, on where people probably are in their prayer life. I think that 20 minutes is probably going to be a challenge for most people. But we ought to be well beyond that. So we're challenging, 20, and, and it, you know what, if everybody's just like, if the entire church completes a challenge, amen, I'll be extremely happy about that. But next year, we're going to be pushing more. You better believe it. <laughs> And you know what, if, 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 you know, personally, this isn't about just um, you know, the time limit I put on it. Make your own challenge for yourself. 20 minutes is a minimum. So just, just keep that in mind. Now, what we see here in the Bible, you know, I said here, Acts chapter 3, verse number 1, at the temple, at the hour of prayer. And why is prayer so important? Well, we even see from this example, there was a certain lame man from his mother's womb he was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So here's a guy that was literally in need. He had a physical need. He was lame. He couldn't work. This is someone who would be deserving of receiving alms, receiving charity from people because he's not capable of going out and working. He's lame. He can't get up and do the job. So people literally had to carry him. And where'd they bring him? They didn't bring him down to the government line. They brought him to the place where he ought to go, to the church. So he's at the gate of the church where people are coming and going, the people of God, where God's people can help provide the needs of someone who's lame. So he's at the gate and he's just, he's asking for alms. He's asking for some help. He can't work. He needs, he needs help in, support, in uh, supporting him. Peter and John show up at the hour of prayer and he's there at the hour. He's not just there for the main service or whatever. He's there at the hour of prayer. And what happens? You know, they look on him. They say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. And he's healed. I don't think it's just a coincidence that he's there at the hour of prayer. And guess what? His prayer gets answered when Peter and John show up. And, you know, the faith that he has heals him and, and, and he's able to walk again. Now, this is just one really small example. There's so many like that in Scripture. Where at the end, we're going to get into some answered prayers. 
But prayer is powerful. The same God that has the power of doing all the miracles, doing all the creation of the world, doing anything that God wants. We see throughout all of the Bible, the things that God is capable of. The, the, the parting of the Red Sea, right? Where God could just make the water stand on end and just completely defy everything that's natural. Uh, bringing a, a person back from the grave, from death. The finality of death is not final with God. The power to do anything, the power to just take the food and what Jesus fed the 5,000 and just in, with very little, make everybody be satisfied with that food. I mean, you could go on and on and on down the list. That same God is a God that we're praying to. That's a God we're asking for help from. And we, when, we, when you think about that and realize that God is capable of anything, is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is no. Nothing is too hard. If anybody is going to limit God, it's us. And when you realize how powerful and how strong God is and everything he's capable of doing, why would we be stupid not to be in more prayer to God and not turning to him more often in humility, recognizing, God, you can help me through all of these things. I need you. Please help me. Instead of being stubborn and stiff-necked and just wanting to do everything on our own. In our own way. Let's go. We, we ought not. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. That's the attitude that God has towards us as his children. Amen. Let's make use of that. Turn to, to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter number 6. We're going to start seeing now just... Different examples of the amount of time that people have spent in Scripture in prayer. Luke chapter 6, verse number 12. By reason, it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose 12, whom also he named apostles. Obviously, he's talking about Jesus Christ, our great example. He continued all night in prayer. Has anyone ever spent an entire night in prayer to God? Where you just said, you know what? I know I'm tired. I have things to do tomorrow. I've got work to do, but I'm going to spend all night praying to God. Jesus did that. And you know what? Jesus isn't the only one in the Bible that spent all night praying to God. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. And I think oftentimes the reason why we don't pray so much is the weariness in our own flesh. It's the weakness of our flesh. We say, well, I'm tired or I got other things to do. And you kind of push it off. Well, Jesus didn't push it off. He said, I mean, think about, think about what that man went through. Jesus Christ was a man that felt all the physical infirmities. He had to go, you know, yes, he was God in the flesh, but he was in the flesh. He experienced what we experience in this human body. He experienced the, the pains that, that go along with being in a physical body. He experienced the, the, the weariness and just the, the depletion of strength that goes along with, with staying up for hours or maybe fasting, not eating, you know, the different things. He experienced all of that stuff. Yet he was still able to do these things. And he did these things in many cases, obviously just because it was right to do, but also for our example. Now, we can also see from, this ex from that example in Luke 6 that he was doing something very important the next day. He was choosing the disciples. That's when he, when he, when he decided who's going to be the 12 that he chooses. Well, before making that major decision and making choices like that, he decided to spend all night in prayer. Now, 
I mean, we read that. Obviously, Jesus wasn't in prayer all night, every night. I mean, he, had, he had to sleep sometimes. But there are times when it is a, appropriate to be spending all night in prayer. I mean, think about major decisions that maybe you have to make in your life. Big, life-changing decisions about jobs, about where to live, about, you know, about church, about whatever, you know, I mean, whatever. You're deciding to maybe marry somebody. Or major life-changing decisions. Hey, maybe you should think about praying all night. Get on your knees. Go to God and ask for the wisdom and the guidance and the counsel just to, to make sure that you're going to make good choices and do what's right. It's not going to be time wasted by any means. You may be tired the next day, sure. But it's not, I mean, that's what Jesus did. He gives us the example. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 9. The Bible says, For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before God. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. This is the heart that the Apostle Paul had and the disciples had for other people, for the other churches, for other saints. He's saying, what thanks can we render God again for you? All the joy worth we joy for your sakes. And again, this goes back to that same heart and attitude that we ought to have towards the brethren and the love for, for your brother and sister in Christ. Joying for your sakes, that makes them happy what's going on with the saints, night and day praying exceedingly. Not just during the nighttime, not just during the daytime, night and day, we're praying exceedingly. I mean, just just continuing to pray in excess exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. They're praying to God. Their prayer for God is, God, we want to see these people more and just to help them out more. That's why it says to perfect that which is lacking in their faith. So any areas where they're having problems, Lord, we're in a, they're, they're praying night and day, God, help me to be a blessing to them. Help me to see them more. Help me to have more of an impact in life. God, help me to help them that they can succeed. This is the mindset and this is what they're actually doing. I don't think the Apostle Paul is lying when he said night and day praying exceedingly. Now oftentimes when people say, oh yeah, I'll pray for you, it is a lie. And that's another thing we need to make sure, you know, you Christian, you individual sitting there today, don't ever do that. It's easy to do. It's very easy to do. Too many people, oh yeah, sure, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you, brother. I'll pray for you. Okay, yeah, I'll pray for you. People ask for prayers. I see people ask for prayers publicly. Online. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that either. You, you know, people on social media, hey, I've got this problem. I'll pray for you. And people say, oh yeah, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. How many times do you forget about that then? You know what I do? You get in the habit of doing this. If I say I'm going to pray for someone, I pray for them right away. Because that way you know <laughs> you're not just saying you're going to pray for someone. Actually do it. And that's why you won't see me commenting on everybody's post. I don't really comment much at all. Anyways, you probably won't see me comment much at all on Facebook or anything like that. <laughs> but if I were commenting, <laughs> I wouldn't just be responding to every single person asking for prayer unless I was literally doing it. Because, yeah, it looks good. It's easy to say, oh, yeah, I'll pray for you. But be careful, you know, just because it sounds good, that you're not just saying things and not doing it. And before, you know, I mean, that's what, that's what the Pharisees did. They, they wanted to be looked at and perceived as spiritual. So they would give their great big speeches of their prayers and, and so everyone could hear how wonderful and how great they are. And uh, it was all about them. And it wasn't about actually just praying for someone because it's right or because they actually had that in their heart. It had more to do with, the, with looking on them. And make sure you don't fall into that trap either of just saying that you'll pray for everyone just because it sounds like the right thing to say. No, actually follow through and do it. 
Um, you're in First Thessalonians 3, flip over to First Timothy chapter number 5. First Timothy chapter 5. The Bible says now she, in verse number 5, Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. Another reference to praying night and day. And this is talking about a widow, right? This is a widow woman who is a widow indeed. It means she's desolate. She has no one else to help take care of her. In the context of 1 Timothy chapter 5, who the church ought to relieve and, and take care of. If someone is a widow indeed, she's desolate. She trusts in God and she's in prayer night and day, praying for the saints. Now we have an example of this. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians 5. Just stay where you're at in that, in that section of the Bible. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 2 of an example of this. Anna, remember last week we talked about the prophetess, Deborah was a prophetess. Anna is another example of a prophetess in the New Testament when, when Jesus was brought into the temple as a baby. Anna was one of the ladies that, um, you know, blessed him and saw him and, and everything else. And uh, in Luke 2.36, I'll just read this for you. The Bible says, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four, four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Now, this woman, it says she was a widow of about 84 years old. Or about 84 years, excuse me. She was a widow. She's been a widow for the past 84 years. This is an old lady. I mean, if she was, if she was 18 years old when she got married, that would put her at 102. So, this is, I mean, it's a pretty, pretty elderly lady. And even for someone who has maybe not the same strength, not the same physical capabilities as other people. You know what the Bible says she did? It says she served God with fastings and prayers. You may be physically debilitated from doing some of the work that other people can do that are younger, that, that, that have the physical capabilities of, you know, uh, when you're younger, it's easier to go out and knock on doors for hours on end and preach the gospel to multitudes and go out and just do a lot of work. When you get, start getting older, it becomes more difficult. It becomes more challenging, but it doesn't mean you can't still serve God. I mean, one, it doesn't mean you can't preach the gospel. It's just the way that you do so might be a little bit different than what younger people can do. But not even just preaching the gospel Hey, make it a point and say, if I, if I literally physically can't do very much, you know what you can do? You can fast and pray and be in service to God in that capacity, in that ability. Say, I can do this. That's what Anna was able to do. And the Bible says that she served God with those fastings and prayers. 1 Thessalonians 5, look at verse number 17. Very short verse. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. Pray without stopping. Don't stop from praying. Don't quit praying. We ought to be in regular. Now, I don't think this means pray without ceasing means just 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're always praying. But we shouldn't just stop Praying in general, right? Pray, we need to be in prayer regular. I mean, you think about praying night and day. We've seen night and day, night and day, night and day. The, the hour of prayer at the temple. Serve God with fastings and prayers night and day. How Does it sound like prayer should be done pretty frequently? Pray without ceasing. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We see another example. 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 2. The Bible says, To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I served for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Apostle Paul expressing to Timothy, I'm praying for you night and day. I'm not forgetting about you. I'm not stopping praying for you. I'm praying for you on a regular basis, night and day, Timothy. 
And you know what? That is an encouragement. When you have someone, one that you know isn't just a hypocrite that's going to say that they pray for someone, but they actually do it. That in itself is edifying and comforting to know, hey, someone else is praying for me. Hey, someone who loves the Lord is praying for me. That means a lot for that person. It, and he's saying in a way not to lift himself up, but this is said in a way to comfort Timothy. This is a letter to Timothy so that he understands, I'm praying for you. People need to hear that sometimes. When you're going through your low points, when you have the problems, when you are in desperate need of prayer, hey, it helps to hear just to know that other people are praying for you. Why does that even help? Well, it goes back to knowing who God is. And you know, you, you could say, you know, there's all kinds of reasons you might be able to think of why, well, God might not hear my prayer. Right? But if I've got this person, this person, this person, you know, I got a whole church praying for me. God's going to listen to one of them. Right? That, and that's why I want. I go through hard times. I want everybody praying for me. Why? Because I, I know who God is. And God has already promised to hear our prayers. So, um, now there's, there's, there's a few caveats to that, but if we pray according to his will, we, he will definitely hear for us, hear, hear us. Um, we'll get into that a little bit here too. Um, let's see another example. You don't have to turn there. Turn to Ephesians chapter six. There's just, there's so many examples of this. I'm just on the first point of just showing how often people are praying and, and, and how much is being done. Just the quantity, praying night and day. And especially when you, if you compile all of the epistles of Paul alone, Paul knows the names of so many people that, that he's gotten to know through his ministry. He's thinking about people. He's saluting them. He's remembering them. He's telling people, I'm praying for you. I remember you. Here we saw Timothy, but it's not just Timothy. He said, I'm not forgetting to pray for you, Timothy, night and day in my prayers. There's many other people, too. It's not just one person. He's praying for a lot of people. In order to even pray for a lot of people, guess what? There's going to be some time spent doing it. I'm going to read for you from Daniel chapter 6. Of course, Daniel is another great man of God that had a great prayer life. And he wouldn't even let something like a law against praying to God before, unless you ask for permission from the government first, stop him from his prayer life that he was dedicated to doing. Daniel's a man that prayed three times a day. It wasn't just once. He prayed three times a day. Daniel 6.10 says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open, in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. This was a habit that he got himself into. He got down on his knees three times during the day. You know what getting down on your knees and praying three times a day is going to do? It's going to keep you humble. It's going to keep you from getting lifted up and full of yourself. Daniel, who was a man that, the, that in man's eyes was lifted up. At this point in his life, the, this is, the people were trying to find any way to destroy Daniel. Why? Because he had gained favor with the king. He had, he had been given a place of prominence in the kingdom. Which that in itself would be the environment in which a man can get lifted up and full of himself because he's been exalted to a position of great power or esteem. But you know how Daniel made sure that he didn't get full of pride? He got on his knees three times a day. And he didn't care about his position so much that he decided, oh no, well, there's this law that says I need to go ask the king first, so I better go ask him before I can pray. He said, no. And he didn't hide it. He wasn't ashamed of it. He said, this is what I've always done, and I'm going to continue to pray for God, and I'm going to get on my knees, and I'm going to pray to God. But that also shows you, when you, if you know the rest of the story, God blessed him for that, and God was able to answer the prayers and to keep him from being devoured by the lions. And the lion then 
that was supposed to be his punishment for obeying God rather than men. But because God is powerful, God is able to protect us from anything. And the faith that Daniel had, and there's a reason why he was praying three times a day, God was there for him in his time of need to protect him and to keep him unscathed. Prayer works. Praying for others. Ephesians 6, I believe is where I had you go. Ephesians 6, look at verse number 17. The Bible says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So here we see that he's praying always, and the supplication is for all saints, for believers, for brethren. Thinking about others. Um, turn to Matthew chapter number 6. So the last place I'm just going to... Um, I'm not going to belabor the point anymore about how frequently people are praying. Daniel's praying three times a day. We see multiple cases, night and day. Jesus Christ spent all night in prayer. Prayer is important. It ought to be a significant portion of your life. The proper spirit we ought to have when we pray is also important. And we get this from Philippians chapter number four. We're going to go to Matthew 6 next. If you want to look at Philippians 4, you can. But, um, you know, oftentimes we end up spending more time in prayer when we actually have needs for ourselves, And that's just a fact. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. We should be doing that. You have problems, you have needs, things are going through. But here's what you need to watch out for. If you want to pray righteously, you're going to pray the right, right way. Don't have a bad attitude about things that are going wrong in your life when you go to God in prayer. Because when things are going wrong... You know, regardless of the, of the purpose, God's allowed that to happen. We ought to go to God, but don't get the spoiled brat type of an attitude or the, the how could you let this happen, God, or kind of the blaming God type of an attitude when you go to God in prayer. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto god be thankful when you pray to god remember to keep that in mind and to keep your yourself humble when you go to when you have the need when things are going wrong to still be thankful there's so many reasons to be thankful if you have nothing else in this life be thankful that god saved your soul from hell Everything could be going wrong. But when you go to God in prayer, be thankful. God, thank you for saving me. I've got all these problems going on in my life. And I need your help with them, God. But thank you. Thank you for where I'm at. Thank you that things aren't worse. Be thankful. That type of an attitude, a heart, humility. God's going to respond to that way more. And you know, we see many examples in Scripture that relate a father-child relationship with us and God because it's something we understand. And I ask, it's not just something we understand, but it's, I believe it's the way that God works with us. We understand the way that, you know, especially those of us that have children, when a child because a prayer is just a request. It's asking for something. That's literally what the word pray means. You're asking for something. When a child comes to you asking for something, the way that they ask is very important. It is. And you can start thinking about your kids, what they've, they've asked you maybe for things in the past. I'll tell you one thing that doesn't fly in my house is when a child says, Dad, give me that. That is the wrong way to ask me for anything in my house if you're my child. That does not get you what you want, ever. <laughs> and you could say, well, of course that makes sense. Well, let's apply that to ourselves when we pray to God. 
How, how, what type of level of respect are you going to show to your heavenly father when you have problems? And you know what else I don't like is the accusatory, well, I need help with this because you didn't. Right. I need getting help done with my schoolwork because you didn't do that. Well, oh, really? Now that's my responsibility that you didn't do something, right? I'm saying all this to, to, you know, to illustrate what maybe we might have an attitude when we go to God when things are going wrong. And people can kind of get that accusatory type of an attitude. You know, yes, we should go in prayer, but, but just remember who you're talking to when you're, when you're talking to the Lord. It's not just your buddy. It's not just, you know, some friend. I mean, you know, what a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. But it's not just your average friend. This is God, right? I mean, this is the son of God or God, you know, God, the father, whoever you're praying to. That's, I mean, keep in mind who you're praying to. Matthew chapter six is where I had you turn. Look at um, verse number five. Matthew chapter six, we, Jesus Christ gives the great example, just a template or a pattern of how we ought to be praying to God. So we're going to do a prayer challenge. We ought to be praying. Why don't we pr follow the model that Jesus gave for, for praying? Verse number five, the Bible says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The whole point he's making in those two verses is just saying it's not the, the point of prayer is not to just be seen of men. It doesn't matter what other people think of you. You shouldn't be praying so that other people can say, wow, what a spiritual person. You're praying because you just want to ask God for something. He's not saying you could never have a public prayer. We do public prayers in church, you know, when the church starts, you know, when the service starts, before preaching, things like that. There's nothing wrong with having a, a public prayer. The whole point, though, is you shouldn't be. And if you're ever asked to pray, it's not it's not a chance for you to shine and show everybody how much how many spiritual words, you know. OK, that's what he's saying. That's not what it's all about. It's about praying from the heart regardless of who's hearing, right? Whether, whether anyone's in earshot or not, you should be able to make the same prayer in your closet that you would anywhere else because it's about praying uh, to God, you know, even in secret, because God would see it in secret, he'll reward thee openly. He'll, he'll be able to answer your prayers. If you're just praying for other people to hear you, guess what? They're hearing you, then God's not. God's saying, okay, that's what you want, that's what you get then. You could get the praise of men and, and that's all you get. But he continues on here. He says in verse number seven, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Now you see, you'll see oftentimes, you know, taking your petitions to God. Well, a repetition is just again and again and again and again and again. You're, you're petitioning over and over and over again the same exact thing, like using the same exact words. This is what the Catholic Church does when they pray. They'll just chant and recite just a preformed prayer over and over and over and over and over and over again. The Bible says that's what the heathen does. That's what the unbelievers do. Just don't be like that. Now, keep this in mind because when, you're, when we are putting a time limit on things and saying, well, hey, you've got to pray for 20 minutes, you don't just pray the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again to fill your 20 minutes. That's not the point at all. <laughs> don't do that. Don't be like the heathen. God, you know, <laughs> again, you can go back to the illustration of having children. Dad, can I have ice cream? 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 No, you're not going to be heard for your much speaking. <laughs> There's another good way of, of getting a no answer. Don't use vain repetitions. It says, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. 
So it's not that God just needs to hear you over and over and over again in order to be like, oh, I guess you need that. No, God knows what you need. And because he knows what you need, that's why he's starting to say it's important how you ask and what you ask for because God already knows what you need. But we still go through this exercise of praying because he wants you coming to him and he wants you coming to him appropriately. And he, even though he knows what you need, it doesn't mean you're always going to get that unless you go to him and ask for it. Hey, God knows that we all need to be forgiven of our sins. God knows that you need a Savior. He knows what you need, but He's not just going to give it to you unless you ask Him for it. You put your faith in Jesus Christ and receive, you, know, you have to receive that gift. Well, there's a lot of other things we need in our life. Yeah, He knows that we need them. He has a full knowledge of it. But let's go to Him and ask for those things so that He can give them to us. Let's acknowledge God and recognize him and, tr and go to him as such. That's why Jesus says here then, he says, look, he knows what you have needed before you even ask him. Verse number nine, after this manner, therefore, pray. So you're going to say, this is kind of how you, this is how you should be praying. <coughs> Our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So he starts off respectfully to God saying, God, you know, father in heaven, your name is hallowed hallowed, it's reverenced, it's set apart, holy. Before you even start asking anything, show respect unto God. Not by saying, you know, referring to God as a man upstairs or just some other slang term to just kind of bring down the name of the Lord. Let's treat God with respect. You start off addressing God, addressing God appropriately. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So again, even before getting into the prayer part, the, 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 the reference here is, God, I want your will to be done. I'm going to be asking you for something, but I want your, the, way, the same way that your will is just done in heaven, because it is right now, there's no sin, there's no, you know, everything that God wants to have happening in heaven is happening right now. God's will is being done all the time. Now, God's will is not always being done on this earth, because people are going out and transgressing God's law and sinning and doing all kinds of things that he doesn't want you to do, but you're doing them anyways. But we want things to be done on this earth according to God's will. And when we pray to God for something, when we're asking God for something, the whole point of even having this in the prayer is so that we're keeping in mind, hey, we want this according to God's will. Not just something that we want that's outside of God's will. I mean, remember when Jesus Christ at, you know, prayed to God and said, you know, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but thy will be done. That's another example prayer of saying, hey, I'll do whatever you want me to do, God. I'm here and I want your will to be done. There's this difficulty in my life, God. I have this problem. I have this thing that's, that's going to be hard or challenging. Is there, is there a way around this or is there something else I could do? Is there, um, you know, you have a problem you're going through. Now, if we're going through a hard time, we still want to make sure God's will is done. Maybe God has a purpose for us going through that hard time that we don't know. And we're asking for relief. We're asking God, can you just make this problem go away? But we still need to keep in mind, no matter what, we want your will to be done. Because if there's something that's going to come out of this that I can't see, that I don't know, I'm willing to go through this fire. If it's going to help other people, it's going to do something good, then fine. You know, but, but I really don't want to. Okay? <laughs> if, if it's your will, I want your will to be done because that's more important than my will. And this is the reference that Jesus is given in his template or his pattern of prayer. And when we pray to God for anything, we need to just keep that in mind that we ought to be recognizing God's will over our own. And that'll help you to pray for the right things also. Um, and then he says, give us this day our daily bread, relying on God for sustenance. And this is a request to God. And this is something that we know that God's going to answer Absolutely. 
He's gonna, he knows the things that we need. But you know what? He also wants us still going to him. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And closing out the prayer, again, recognizing the power, the authority of everything to God. Hey, you're the one in charge, God. You know, we're, I'm asking you, please feed me today. Give me what I need. You know, forgive me my, my debts where, you know, I'm, where I owe people. You know, I've forgiven other people, God. Look at that and, and forgive me for, for my faults and, and my shortcomings. And God, help me not to be led into temptation. You know, get, don't, don't let evil things happen. You know, protect me. This is the template that Jesus Christ gave. It's not something to be chanted and recited over and over and over again. Our, you know, our Father, the, the, the Lord's Prayer, just chant over and over and over again. But, you know, oftentimes people don't know how to, I didn't know how to pray. When I was younger and I was in the Presbyterian church, and I had something going wrong in my life or someone passed away. I didn't know, like I felt like I should pray to God, but no one ever taught me how to pray and I just recited the Lord's Prayer just because it's like, I don't know what to do. Well, God doesn't want you chanting some prayer. He wants you just praying from your heart and, and asking Him the things that you, you have need of, considering His will, and showing the respect that, that he deserves. It's pretty simple. It's nothing complicated. 1 John chapter number 5 explains to us additionally, as we already saw in Matthew chapter 6, about praying according to the will of God. So when you're in prayer... Be mindful of what God's will is. The way you're going to know what God's will is by reading his word. Don't forget when you pray to God, he has answers already in his word. So don't have a one-sided conversation with God where you're doing all the asking and everything else and you're not hearing from God's word where the answer is already. Now, if you've kept up with the, with the challenge, for, you know, we're, we're already should be doing the hearing. So now we're going into the, to the asking in February. So this is, this is probably, I would say, the proper order. Let's listen first and then go and, you know, and ask God. Say, hey, God, I'm listening. You know, I, want, I want you to help me here. But um, don't just ask for a bunch of foolish things when we see his will here. But look at verse uh, 14, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Anything according to the will of the Lord, he says, I hear that. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So if it's according to his will, we ask him, we know that he hears us and we know that we're just going to get it automatically. There's a lot of things that God wants for you. The Bible says, if, you know, if, you, if, if you want wisdom, ask. In James chapter 1, go, you know, go to God who, you know, who, who um, uh, he'll give it to you liberally, upbraid if not. You know? and, and again, I don't have the verse 100% um, memorized, but look it up in James chapter 1 where... Uh, if you ask for wisdom, God will give it to you. That's according to God's will. There's many things that are according to God's will. You want to understand Scripture more? Pray to God for that. You want to have boldness in preaching the gospel? Pray to God for that. That's according to His will. You want people to get saved? Pray to God that He'll help you. You want to walk in the Spirit? Pray to God to help give you the strength to overcome the lust of the flesh. Those are all things according to the will of God. You know what? God's going to hear every single one of those prayers. Every single one of them. Turn to James chapter 5. We're going to close just hopefully giving some encouragement on prayer when we see some great examples in Scripture of prayers just being answered. 
and you understand why is this so important? Why should I be spending so much time in prayer? Well, because it works. Because it literally does work. And the last aspect of the prayer challenge that I want to recommend that you do is keep track of everything that you pray for for the month of February. Keep a journal. Keep notes. Write down the things that you pray for starting on February 1st. And as prayers get answered, mark that also in that same journal. And just keep track of everything that you've asked for. And then when the month is over, just look back and just, and just look at the results. And they may not all happen within that month, but I would continue just to keep going forward with that. And you could really look back and see. Well, because like I said before, people oftentimes will just forget. You know, once you get past that really hard moment, oh man, that was, whew, got past that, you're thankful immediately, but it's really quick to go right back into the routine of things. Okay, things are going well, and you just kind of go back, and you totally forget about what happened. It's good to be able to look back and just look back over the past few months or the past year and go be like, wow, I prayed for all of these things, and look at the results. It's, it's very beneficial to, to do that and to just be a, another source of encouragement and just for the Bible to ring true again and again. And I mean, we know it's true. But when you just see those things, it's just that much more encouraging. James chapter 5, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. So people are afflicting you. You're having problems. You're having, you know, any, anything, you know, someone bringing evil upon you, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now we believe the Bible when it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, right? I mean, do you believe that with all of your heart? Amen. Amen. When the Bible says, is any sick among you, let him call for those of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Do you believe that? Amen. There's now look, I'm not some, some phony, holy roller Pentecostal that does everything for a show, that wants to show other people how spiritual I am by rolling around on the floor, foaming at the mouth, speaking in, in demonic languages, and... and you know, deceiving people, making merchandise of people by selling stuff like, oh, this is, this is just like the cloth of the Apostle Paul and, and using hocus pocus and, and, you know, this nonsense lying to people about the, you know, these healings and come, you know, come pay a hundred dollars to, to come to our event and get healed where you have actors coming up and getting smacked in the forehead and, oh, wow, all of a sudden I could, you know, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about real, the real power of God. And just because there's a lot of fraudsters out there, don't let that, don't let that make you think that, well, you know, God's just not powerful today because there's a bunch of phonies out there. No. This is in here for a reason. I mean, you, you heard the report that we had of Brother Batter in Texas. I read it out loud for you. I mean, the doctors had said, no explanation other than a miracle. You know why? Because God can still heal people. And when you're following God's way and you're doing things the way that he says and, and you believe the word of God and you pray in faith, well, the prayer of faith is going is gonna to save the sick. And continuing on in James chapter 5, it says, verse number 16, confess your faults one another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. An effectual, fervent prayer. Not just in passing, oh yeah, I almost forgot, God, okay, and then, and then move on. No. An effectual, fervent prayer is you're spending time. You're putting time aside and you are serious about, about praying for someone else. 
effectually, fervently for someone. The Bible says that avails a lot. That actually does a lot of good. And then it brings up the example of uh, Elijah. And here's uh, verse 17. It says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. Look, he was just an ordinary man. Just like you have, have, you, you have this flesh. You go through the same things. Well, guess what? Elijah was a man just like us. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. Well, who can do that? No one can do that. You don't have power over the weather. No, I don't, but God does. And you have a righteous man fervently praying. And you know what? It was effective. Because God answered his prayer. Elijah was the one asking God of, to do something. And you know what? God did it. It says, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. So as we're being instructed, hey, pray. Pray fervently. It, it matters. It avails much. He gives a reminder, don't forget. These things happen. Don't forget this is real. Don't forget that a man just like you, I mean, yeah, he's someone that gets lifted up as a great example, as a great man of God, but he's still just a man. He was able to pray to God for not to rain. It didn't rain for three and a half years. Turn to Acts chapter 12. It's the last place I'll have you turn. We'll close on this, this one last example. The only other example I had in my notes was in Genesis 24 where um, Abraham sent his servant to go find a wife for Isaac. His servant goes off to find the wife and he prays to God to prosper and to help him to find that, that wife. And the Bible says in verse 15 there of Genesis 24, it says, And it came to pass before he had done speaking that, behold, Rebekah came out. He wasn't even completely finished with his prayer and God already answered it. God works like that. He already knows the thoughts and he knows the needs, but the prayer is still important and necessary to receive what we want. Look at Acts chapter 12, verse number five. The Bible says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. This isn't an accident that, you know, if prayer didn't matter, then there'd be no reason to even include this in the Bible. So, well, God's just going to do it anyways. Really? Then why did he even mention that this prayer was made without ceasing? Why does he even mention that it avails much? Because these things are important because we should be doing them to, to have God hear us. Um, so we have an entire church here praying without ceasing for Peter because he was going through our time because they love Peter and they want him to, to not suffer all the affliction that he had. Verse 6, And when Her Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. This is an impossible situation to get out of, humanly speaking. I mean, he's literally between two guards, locked up in inner prison. You know, I mean, there's, there's no getting out of here. It's impossible. But does that mean that the church, well, there's no way you could get out. So forget, why waste our time? Let's go do something else. No, they prayed for him. Especially when there's an impossible situation. Let's go to God. And we can't do anything about this, but you know who can? God can. And you know who did? God did. Verse number seven, Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. I mean, all this stuff is happening. He's like, this can't be happening. There's no way this could be happening. He's like, I got to be dreaming. Right? Chains fall off him. He's just walking out of the prison. Everyone's sleeping or whatever. He's just like, <laughs> it's surreal. But you know what? It was real. It says in verse 10, when they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, 
which opened to them of his own accord. There's a prison door, the main gate that's locked up. And he just opens it up. You can just walk on out. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. When he's standing there for a minute, he's out in the street, he's already past the prison. He's just kind of like pinching himself. Wait, this, this is real. <laughs> I'm not sleeping. Like I'm, I'm literally right here. So then he, uh, he continues here, verse number 12. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Remember the church was praying without ceasing for him? And he shows up, and guess what? They're still praying. Why? Because they don't even know the news yet that, he's, that their prayer has already been answered. And they're still praying for him. Look at the consideration that they have for Peter. The church comes together. This isn't just a regular church service. Again, remember that. This isn't just during church. They love someone, a brother in Christ, enough to gather together and say, you know what? We're all going to pray for him. This is serious. This is real. I think we're missing some of that. That level of devotion to your brothers and sisters in Christ to stop what you're doing, to stop your busy schedule and say, hey, let's get together and pray. And I think if this is incorporated more, we'd see a lot more of the power of God in our lives. Because God is just as powerful now as he ever was. Verse 13, And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Now, I can understand the shock. But let's not forget, you know, when we pray, we can expect prayers to be answered. It was so impossible. It didn't make them stop praying, but even they had a hard time believing that it was true that he was literally there. But we don't need to have that shock. We can expect for these things to happen. We have so many examples in Scripture of this stuff happening and you know, like I said, I'd be lying if I said I couldn't understand how they could be shocked that God actually answered a prayer, right? I'd be lying. I probably would be shocked too. But overjoyed, obviously, as they were and just, and just thrilled that this, this happened. But this is why you pray. Now, not everything that you pray for all the time, you're going to see that result but oftentimes, I think it's because it may not be according to God's will. God might have another purpose. God could have had another purpose for Peter being in prison, and he wanted Peter to do some other work for him where he would be transferred to another jail or reach some other people, whatever, right? And we just aren't completely aware of that. But in this case, God's like, yeah, he's preaching the word of God, and I want him here, and I want him doing more preaching, so I'm going to set him free from prison. Everyone's asking for it. Yeah, I'll give him that request. I've got some more work for him to do. And we always ought to be going to God with that type of an attitude, knowing, God, we know you can do this. And, and hopefully we wouldn't even be shocked when it happens, just rejoicing. I mean, they were so shocked, like, Peter's knocking at the door, and she hears him, and, and she's like, oh, wow, Peter's, and she, and she didn't even, like, let him in. She runs back. She's so excited. And they're just like, you're crazy. Peter's not at the door. Like, okay, you saw some, maybe it's his angel or something. Like, it's not Peter. But then he's still out there like, hello, can I come in? You guys gonna let me in? And, and of course they go and bring him in and it was a great experience. But, um, the, you know, prayer works. Amen. Don't forget that. Let's, let's take this challenge coming up on the first, later this week, Get a head start on it. 
I mean, this isn't something that's only supposed to be like, like none of these things are just, well, that month's over and now I don't need to do that anymore. Right? I don't need to read my Bible anymore. I already read the New Testament. I read that once. Okay, done. Or I read, you know, I, I prayed. Now I don't, you know. No, the whole point is one, to challenge you to do more, but, but to not just to challenge you, but to, to get good habits and understand and realize the importance of all of these things so that you can make the, the priorities appropriate in your life with your time and your time management and say, what else can I cut out? Because these challenges, they're going to be taxing on your time. Every single one of them. You probably noticed that maybe with the Bible reading, if you haven't been doing that much Bible reading in general already, you're trying to find, well, where am I going to do the time for this? Well, guess what? Something's got to go. Something's got to give. Right. And I think we could use a little bit more trimming of the fat when it comes to the, the fatness of the time that we actually have and you realize, hey, I can cut some here, I could cut some here, I could start inserting more godly things into my schedule. And these challenges hopefully will help you to do that. Whatever you end up trimming along the way, don't pick those back up again. Just leave them, be gone. you're doing fine without it. Let's start inserting more godly things. Keep your Bible reading and now add the, the extra time for prayer. Let's bow our eyes and word of prayer. Dear Lord, it is such an amazing thing that, that you do hear us and that you care about us and all the infirmities of the flesh that we have and, and we know that you, you fully understand the things that we go through. And uh, even though we're, we're not really worthy of anything, you've already given us the, the more than, than anyone could ever expect, but um, you still want us to come to you in prayer. And, and Lord, uh, we thank you so much for, for loving us to that extent and hearing us. I pray that you please help us to hear from you more, that we could know what your will is and that we could get our prayers in alignment with, with the things that, that you would have for us. And um, God, we, we want your power to be made known unto the world and um, to bring the lost unto Jesus Christ, Lord. And that's why we're here. That's why we're gathered together. We need to be uh, worked on and we, we need your help, Lord. And we could do nothing in our own power God, please, please bless us today. Help us not to be forgetful hearers, but doers of the work. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.